So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. Okay, we're in a series called You Asked For It. Uh, what happened was during the Christmas, hol Christmas holiday, what we did, we have a special service. We, had, uh, we, in, we actually gave an interview to over 800 people and asked people, what are the things you want to hear about this fall when we have a sermon series? And so you guys voted on what you wanted to hear. And as a result, we put them together, the six-week series. And last week, the number one question you asked is, how do I deal with stress? That was the second year in a row. So this, <laughs> and now the second topic you asked about was spiritual warfare. Are we fighting spiritual warfare? Now, you want to ask yourself the question, what's spiritual warfare? Well, have you noticed there's a lot of bad things that are happening out there today? Have you ever been in circumstances where you're like, there's something going on here. It's not just an argument, but there's like evil in the room. There's something going on with the workplace. There's something going on in society where I sense that something's happening. You know, uh, there's been studies on this type of thing, and even psychologists and psychiatrists would agree that it seems that there's a spiritual world out there beyond what you see in the natural, that there's something more at play. And, of course, the Bible talks about that. Now, unfortunately, there's two opposite things that can happen with spiritual um, insights. C.S. Lewis, the great Oxford professor, said the following. He said, I'm paraphrasing, there's two things that we can do that are not a good idea. The first thing is to overemphasize the demons and all that kind of thing. We, all the people talk about is that. The other one is not to recognize they're involved in their lives at all. But the truth is, they're happy with both exaggerations. Truth is, we live in a spiritual realm. I don't know if you realize it or not. Right now, I pick up my phone, and I can tell you right now that there's microwaves, there's cellular data, there's all sorts of things going through the air right now. Radio waves, TV, transmissions, all these things are happening right now, but you can't see it, can you? But if you pick up your phone, you can be able to dial in to an atmosphere you're not even aware of. And just because you can't see what your five senses does not necessarily mean it doesn't exist. And so we are in a spiritual battle, believe it or not. There are forces out there. Now, there's not some guy in a red jumpsuit walking around. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's not that way, okay? There's not some demons running around trying to scare you. But there are physical, there are forces out there. And the Bible talks about it. And the Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the power of his might. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church of his day and speaking to us. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the devil is not some guy in a red jumpsuit. The devil, according to the Bible, is a fallen creature we see in the book of Isaiah. And that there are evil forces out there that are fighting against good forces. And so it talks about that. Wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood alone, right? But against the principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. And what does that mean? What that means simply is this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That what you see in the natural is not all there is. That there is a spiritual world out there. In fact, there's a bunch of folks that would even say that, that we have read about recently. I don't know if you know the, that Scalia, the former uh, chief justice, said there definitely he believed in the devil, and he talked about it in an interview. Yes, there are evil forces out there. They're fighting for the souls of mankind. When you see the atrocities of ISIS and, and all these horrible things that are taking place through terrorism, when you see ethnic cleansing, when you see the evil perpetrated, it's like unbelievable. It's evil. And, of course, evil is the opposite of live, which is life. And so the Bible says that we are in a warfare. We are in a warfare. Now, how many folks know that in the military, there's about four or five divisions, isn't there? There's the Army. There's the Navy. There's the Marines. There's the Air Force. Who would I forget? Coast, oh, the Coast Guard. For how many of you are in the Coast Guard here this morning? They're always the forgotten ones, aren't they? Okay. But there's different things. And what happens is we're like the army. We're on the ground. And you cannot win a war only with ground troops, can you? And you can't win a war only with air. 
You need ground troops, air troops, all working together. And the truth of the matter is God has placed us on this planet to be his hands and feet. And our generally, our jurisdiction and our influence is primarily in the five senses, the physical world. But we are wrestling not against flesh and blood. Have you ever been in a circumstances where maybe you gave into anger or something? And you're like, man, something came over me. It's almost like there's evil all about me. Or how about this? You're, you're talking to somebody, and you're hearing in your mind, you're hearing, they don't care about you. You're not important. And you hear almost like a whispering in your ear. You know what I'm talking about, you know, the old adage of the angel and the demon on your shoulder? Am I the only one ever experienced that? Well, you just sense two voices in your head, and there's a battle going on for you to choose the right one. And this is what happens in the spiritual realm. And the Bible says there are principalities. Now, principalities, municipalities, like the municipality of Cheshire, they're different jurisdictions. According to Daniel 9 and 10, Daniel was praying for 21 days. And what does the Bible say? That there was a war going on in the heavenlies over this. Now, I know this sounds kind of like, wow, come on, be serious. But you will see that this indeed is and true according to the Scriptures. But against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I want to encourage you to realize that when you're dealing with something, there's something more going on than meets the eye. Ever find that? What is going on in this situation? What, you ever go in a situation where you just sense there's something not right? You just walk in an environment, there's like, there's like an atmosphere. Well, there's a spiritual atmosphere that's there. You see, and you and I make a choice, but there is a demonic realm and an angelic realm that would try to get us to make certain choices. They're trying to influence us because the primary function of mankind is to have authority where God's placed us. And so these spiritual forces are trying to influence us to make different choices. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you about this in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. And I went into a strong uh, explanation of what can happen and how you battle. I'm not going to go there again today. Instead, I want to focus on the army of God, on the armor of God, and how we can fight against this. You see, what can often happen if you're in the military and the army is there on the ground, what they'll say, what they'll do sometimes have a laser beam, and they'll paint a target. Maybe it's a bunker or a certain building. They'll paint it with a laser beam. And then the Air Force flies over, and they can see where you painted that target, and they'll drop a smart bomb. Okay? In many ways, when you and I pray, what we're doing is we're asking God to come on our behalf and to do something. But primarily, the, the battle begins in the mind. So the Bible says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. I want to show you a couple other things in Scripture about that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, although we walk in the flesh, our bodies, right, we do not war according to the flesh, for our weapons, our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Often there's strongholds of the mind, negative thinking, strongholds that you have built up in your life. This is where the enemy primarily gets into us is through wrong thinking. If they can get us to think wrong, then we can start to act wrong, and he begins to influence those areas of our lives. Now, I want to share a story with you briefly to illustrate a point. There was a great man by the name of Elisha who came after Elijah, and I'll go ahead and read the story. He was beginning to tell people, tell the military commanders what the enemy was doing, and so they were upset with him. we got to catch this guy, Elisha, because he knows the secrets. So they sent an army to capture him, which brings us to the story found in 2 Kings. And when the servant on the, of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more, more than those who are with them. The Bible says, Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. You don't have to fear evil. Because good will always triumph over evil. The power of God is greater than the power of evil. Make no mistake about it. And so Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, a mountain was full of horses and chariots on fire, a fire all around Elisha. So he said, God, open his eyes. Now, if I could, if I could hand out some spiritual Ray-Bans, 3D4 glasses, which you are able to see in the spiritual realm. I, I, I really believe this. You'd be able to see. If you could open your eyes right now and see into a different realm, you'd see a spiritual realm. There are angels and there are demons. And these angels, by the way, and the demons are not these ugly, horrific creatures. They're called angels of light. And they're trying to influence us to make certain choices. 
Because if they can get us to make choices, then they have more jurisdiction upon our lives. And so this is what happens, folks. Listen, you may not believe it, but it's true according to the Scriptures. And I have known some people that have literally seen demons. I, I went to Africa, Kenya, and we actually prayed over people and cast out demons. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy. Here in the Western mind, we don't necessarily believe that. And a lot of people don't believe that. But I was reading a psychiatrist wrote in the Washington Post. His name is Richard Gallagher. And he was a board-certified psychiatrist and psychologist. And he said in the article, and he said, listen, we have dealt with all type of medications and counseling, and we found we were getting nowhere. There was something beyond the normal confines of medical science. And so he got involved with exorcisms, and he said these people noticeably got better as a result of that. There are demonic realms out there. There is an enemy out there that wants to kill and destroy us. And so we have to understand that. So if you're fighting, like, you know, sometimes in relationships and situations, you're fighting with your spouse or fighting with a coworker, or there's fights in the church, and you can think, well, this is just because of that person's personality. No, chances are there is a spiritual realm that's taking place. I never forget there was a situation not too long ago. My wife's not here, but I'll go ahead and share it. I, I, there came a point where we just started, I don't know what happened, but we just started arguing to the point where I was getting, like, too angry. I'm like, what is going on here? So, you know, honey, let's just pray right now. Something's not right. So my wife and I came together and said, Lord and Jesus, we just submit to you. We command any evil influence to stop right now in the name of Jesus. You know what happened? Poof, it, it actually left. And peace came back in our house again. Sometimes stuff happens if we allow it. Now, how do we fight this battle? Well, the 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 4, 3 through 4 says this. If the good news we preach is hidden beyond a veil, it's hidden from the people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, okay, he has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So what happens is the enemy's out to deceive us and try to get us to think the wrong things, to do the wrong things. The truth of the matter is, do you realize that God wants to give you an abundant life? That's his purpose. He's created you to love him and enjoy him forever. And I would say this, everybody. Almost everyone in the world that I've ever met wants to be happy. They want to be healthy. They want to find purpose in their lives, right? They do. Most people that I know want to live a good life. But what happens? They listen to lies. And these lies entrap them until they can go down such a road that they begin to, their heart begins to be broken and they get a corrupt mind by going the wrong direction. And so what we want to do is not be upset with people. Say, listen, there's a better way. You see, we're not fighting against people. We're fighting against principalities. We're, think, we're fighting against mindsets. We're fighting against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. So we need to understand that and say, God, I just pray right now that the, the God of this world will be blinded. And you can walk under circumstances and bring peace. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to look through some armament, things in the armor of God, and how spiritually it can change us. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking, was living in Roman times. And, and under, make no mistake, in those days, there were Roman soldiers everywhere. And the Apostle Paul was chained to them. And so they would see them with all sorts of armament on. So the Apostle Paul used something people understood to describe the unknowable. So a little bit for us today, it's a little hard. We don't have people walking around with Roman armament. So what I'm going to do now is kind of explain to you what the Apostle Paul is saying and how it is an analogy of how we can live our lives in truth, okay? So let's go ahead and read it again. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Having girded your waist with truth. Now, what does that mean? Let's continue to look at it. In the Roman armament, that, that's me, by the way. I took a picture. No, that's not me. Okay. This is, represents a Roman guard. And, and this is what the kind of armor they wore. And they had something called the belt of truth. I never forget my father preached on this many moons ago. And... Uh, I'm going to embarrass you because you embarrass me sometimes, so I can embarrass you now. My dad preached on the belt of truth one Sunday. You know what he did? He preached and didn't have his belt on. His pants fell down in church. And he had Bermuda shorts on. And someone complained and said the pastor dropped his pants in church in front of the children. I'm not making this up. He was making, I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> my father did that. I learned my dad's lesson. Okay. But anyhow, the belt of truth. And by the way, it was an illustration for kids' sermon. It was kind of funny. Okay. Belt of truth. There you go, Dad. Belt of truth. 
Hey, come on, welcome my mom and dad here. They're here today. It's so good to see them. <laughs> All right. Got you back now, see? He used to preach about me when I was all growing up. All right. So you got the belt of truth. And the belt of truth, what this was, this was a central part of the armament. It was like the central part that put everything together. You would actually, your shield would be there, your sword would be there, your loincloth would be there. All these things would work together to bring you balance. Listen, the Bible says that truth is very important. Truth, the belt of truth. Are you living in the truth? And what does the Bible say about truth? And you will, this is Jesus speaking, and you will what? Know the truth. And the Greek word for know in the Greek is gnosko, which means well acquainted with intimately. You shall know the truth intimately and know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, if the truth can set you free, what can hold you in bondage? Lies, precisely. Since the truth will set you free, lies will hold you in oppression. And so if the enemy can get you to believe a lie, a lot of people think they're not, I'm no good. I'll never amount to anything. I get so upset. People say, oh, stupid me. I forgot my keys again. Don't say that about yourself. You're speaking negativity on yourself. You're welcoming bad things to happen. Speak the truth. I am a child of God, and I forgot my keys, and it's my wife's fault. Okay, that's what you got to do. <laughs> or do what I did and get a little tile. They're fantastic. These little things have GPSs on them. Okay, look. Beside the point there. Anyhow, since the truth will set you free, lies will hold you in oppression. And Jesus talks about what truth is. He says this, you are the father of the devil. You know who he's talking to, by the way? Jesus is talking to the church of his day. You know what? Even today, the most difficult things we face in our society today are not necessarily, quote, unquote, the sinners, but often the church. People that proclaim to love God. And yet, they're living in such hypocrisy and legalism. He said, you are the father of the devil. You do not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, it is a lie. He speaks from his own resources. He is a liar. So who's the father of lies? The enemy. Who is truth? Jesus is truth. Jesus said to him, I am. And when he says, I am, it's the same connotation that God used in Mount Sinai. I am the great I am. I am what? I am the way. Jesus does not show us the way. He is the way. Jesus is the truth. He doesn't show us the truth. He is the truth. And the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. So what is truth? Truth is Jesus. And so we need to fill ourselves with the truth of God. You shall know the truth. And so I want to encourage you to do what I've done for a number of years now. I do it periodically. I'll go to Romans chapter 6, and I will pray the Scriptures. Let's go back and read what the Scripture says here. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what is that? The breastplate of righteousness, excuse me, is this very important. It what? It protects your internal organs. Very important. Your heart, your lungs, all these important things. And the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what does righteousness mean? Does righteousness mean it's boring? No. Righteousness means doing things the right way. Now, I never, a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, there was a person in our church, I won't mention their name, but their child filled the gas tank. It was a gas gasoline engine, and they filled it with diesel fuel. I'm not going to say who it is. And they know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to mention who it is. And what happened was they had to spend all this money because the wrong fuel was put into the engine and did problems in the engine. You see, God has told us to run a certain way. He loves us. He's designed us. And so when you and I choose to go away from his design, we end up hurting ourselves. Listen, we talked about forgiveness, right? And so if I choose not to forgive somebody, what begins to happen is bitterness gets in my heart. And they've done studies. I've talked about this already. They've done studies that unforgiveness is bad for your health, that, you know, it really hurts you. Or if you have anger or you have unforgiveness. How about anger? I mean, some of you, the way you drive. I mean, I've seen such great anger when people drive. You know, I just go like this. I go like this. I just go, hey, how you doing? A smile and wave. And they wave back. An in international sign of peace. The breastplate of righteousness, doing the right things. 
when I choose to live in forgiveness, when I choose to do the right thing, the Bible says, therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what does this all mean? Above all else, guard your heart. Why? It's the wellspring of life. And when the Bible talks about heart in, in, a, in um, Proverbs, it talks about the epicenter, the, the grand central station of your life. Everything comes from your heart. So you've got to guard your heart. How do you guard your heart? By living right. By being truthful, not living in lies. By putting an honest day's work in. You know, you, you said you're going to do something, you do it. When you have a sales presentation, you don't say that the product does something it doesn't do. You say, this is what it does. You live in truth. You live in a relationship. Listen, I, I try to tell folks, it's not fun to go through a bunch of relationships and break your heart four or five, six different times. It's best to, to you know, guard your heart. Don't just give your heart to anybody. I tell our children, right? Wait for the right person. Don't get yourself broken. And It's not easy. And the Bible talks about these types of sins. That they actually hurt you. God loves you and doesn't want to see you get hurt. So righteous living, doing the right thing, telling the truth, working hard, being nice to people, right? Bringing peace. And so above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from your heart. And so that's important. The Bible even says in 1 Corinthians, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. It's not like God's upset, oh, they're having a good time down there. They can't do that. He realizes that it's intimacy that forms a relationship and that utilizing it and using it in the wrong context out of that side of marriage, you end up hurting yourself. And psychologists and psychiatrists will tell us today that when people are involved with these types of things, they hurt themselves. And so the Bible talks about this, not because God wants to limit our fun. He wants to give you more fun. I've come to give you life and life abundantly. And so guard your heart. It's the well spring of life. So you have the breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth, now the shoes of peace. And they were like cleats, and they would use that. They would kind of dig in, and they would work together, and they could fight against the enemy. You need to have the right shoes on, or it's difficult to move forward. And the Bible says this in Romans. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that nice to know that we don't have to have our act together? All we got to do is call God, and he'll come and save us despite our circumstances. But how can they call on him? Uh, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about it unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go to them without being sent? This is why the Scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news, bringing the gospel of peace. You see, God has chosen mankind. He's chosen the church to bring forth his light his grace, his healing to the world to help eliminate suffering and difficulty by bringing the peace and grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's the gospel of peace. What happens when you enter a room? Does peace follow you or turmoil? People go, oh, God, here he comes. Or, oh, God, I'm so glad they're here today. What happens when you come home from work? I mean, we should bring peace where we go. Our workplace, people should be happy to see us. Not, oh, no, here they come right? You should bring peace with you. And the Bible says when you go into a town, speak peace to the place you're going. If they don't accept your, your lesson, then shake the dust off your feet. We have the power to bless people. Why not bless people? The whole world curses people. Why not bless people and say, hey, it's so nice to see you. Why not find something redeemable about a person? Because every person is made in the image of God. So why not find something beautiful about somebody and say, you know, what? I see this in your life. Bring peace, the gospel of peace. And what's the gospel of peace? The good news of Jesus Christ, that God has designed you for a purpose. He loves you, and you're trying it the wrong way. You're hurting yourself. There's a better way to go. This is what the whole purpose of Christ is coming to the earth, to save us from ourselves, right? So we have the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and now we have the shield of faith, taking the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. We must believe he exists, right? And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And, and the shield of faith was about four foot high, about this, about a foot or more, two feet wide. And what they used to do is they used to take the shield. Sometimes they'd soak it in water so when the fiery darts came, it would extinguish them. Sometimes the Roman guards would have, uh, the soldiers would have a small shield for hand-to-hand -hand combat. But when they fought together as a group, they often had these shields together, and they worked together. And these shields of faith would help extinguish 
the enemy. So then, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to include, listen, the best defense is a strong offense, right? Well, how do you have a strong offense without building up your defense? And so what I want to encourage you to do is to prepare yourself in time like this. When you read the word of God every day and you pray and you say, God, I gave you this day. This day is not my own. This day is yours. Lord, I pray that I would be an instrument of your peace today. When you pray and you read the word of God, build yourself up in your faith that when difficult times come, it's like going to the gym where you're lifting weights. And so when you get out on the, get out on the football field, you've worked, you've studied, you've done the drills, and when it's time to make the play, you're ready because you've prepared yourself. And so when you're in the Word every day, reading and praying, it's not because God's upset with you. You need to read the Bible. No, it's not about that. You get to read the Bible to get stronger, right? It's an opportunity. It's like practicing drills and, and getting things right in your heart. Now when you go on the field, you're ready because you've been practicing. And so the best offense is often a strong defense that you're strong. So the Bible says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And one of the things that the soldiers would do in the Roman times is that they'd line up. They'd interlock. Their shields would interlock, and they would make a wall like a tank. You know what's even greater? When you work with your faith with other people that have the same faith you do in the church. This is why we're encouraging today to get involved with small groups. Not because we have a church program. Because what happens is we're better together than by ourselves. And that when you find other people like minded and you work together, we have folks coming together. We're battling. Just this past week in, uh, in one of our groups, a bunch of men got together. A gentleman was struggling in some family situations. They said, listen, we're going to gather around you. We're going to interlock our shields together. And some older gentleman that's been married for over 55 years says, I'll help mentor you. And the other guy said, we're going to pray for you and help you and encourage you. And so we text him throughout the day, you can do it. And we're interlining our shields together. And so what happened, when the enemy shoots, we kind of stick together. We go, go down like this, make a shelter. And this is what is the power of working together and putting your faith together. The Bible says in, in Psalm 133, how blessed it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's there that God commands a blessing. Are you all by yourself? Listen, we want to encourage you to get involved with other folks that are going after the same thing. We have all kinds of small groups from, from hunting to, to book studies. I mean, it's amazing. We have all sorts of things. Get to know other people so you can form relationships and begin to make a difference with other people. And we can fight together. We can win together. It says in the book of James, pray for one another that you would be healed. There's a lot of one another in Scripture. So you have the helmet of salvation and put on the helmet of salvation. And that's a very important thing. Your helmet is where the thinking takes place. My friends, this is the gateway of our bodies. This is the gateway. What you think you will become, make no mistake about it. What you think goes from your head to your subconscious to your heart, and then it finds itself in your hands. If you can get it in your head first, you can stop it before it gets here. That's why Jesus said in the Bible, he who hates his brother in the Sermon on the Mount is guilty of murder. Why? Because he realizes that if it happens here, this is where it takes, this is where hate's word starts. Hate starts in the mind, gets down to the heart, and then you act out. So if you can get it in the mind, well, how do we do that? Taking every thought captive and making obedient to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. And so realize this the helmet of salvation is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not by pulling your act together, because you can't. You and I are never good enough. But Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And so if we will receive what he's done for us, it puts a helmet of salvation upon us. Then we have the sword of the Spirit, an offensive weapon. What's that? Sword of the Spirit is this. For the Word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus in the wilderness. Remember that? Where the devil came said, if you are, and he says, he answered the if with an it, it is written. And when you know the word of God, it gives you strength to do this. Sometimes you might feel like, man, I'm a failure. I can't do this. I can't do this. Like I said, no, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but peace, love, and a sound mind. And I can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're no good. No, I've been forgiven. I've been bought with a price. I am a child of God. I'm made in God's image. 
When you begin to know who you are, you can stand in confidence on who you are. So the Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divisions of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow, and it is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so the Bible says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare and our carnal but mighty in God. For what? Pulling down strongholds. Strongholds are primarily in the mind. My father grew up many years as an orphan child, place to place to place to place, orphanages. And, on, and what happened, he was told, you're nothing. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never, you're a loser. He was told that all his life. Finally, at the age of 16, he had, a, he had a visitation of God where he had like a vision of Jesus and he heard God's voice. It says, David, I love you. And that changed his entire life because he believed in a lie. You see, and what happens is we break down the weapons and now you know you're a child of God. And so how do you do that? What? Pulling down the strongholds, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the beings to Christ. What is Christ called? He's the truth, right? So I hear lies. You can't make it. God's forgotten you. you. You've blown it too bad. You can never be restored. No, I am a child of God. I'm made in God's image. And though I'm not perfect, God is perfect. I receive his forgiveness. I've asked God for forgiveness. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Confess your sins in one another that you may be healed. So there's a point where you can proclaim the scriptures and stand on it. And you can break the power of darkness through this. I encourage you to go back and listen to that part of the message in the Lord's Prayer. I go into greater depth of how to fight that, okay? So that's what we need to do. We need to fight it in that capacity. And then finally, part of the process of fighting the Spirit after it goes through all these things, the helmet of salvation says this, pray in the Spirit at all times. That Listen, you know, God has given us the Spirit of God. And we believe, sometimes you pray in your spiritual language, you're praying the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit at all times, and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent. Now, how do you pray at all times? I mean, we need to quit our jobs and say, okay, I can't come out today. I'm going to stay in my room the whole day and pray. Of course not. That's not what he's saying. But when I go on vacation or I drive someplace, my family will be in the car with me, and Sandra will be in my right-hand side. Usually I like to drive, and, and, and I'm driving. And we're not talking the whole time, but I know she's there. And every once in a while she says, you're missing, the, you're missing your exit. No, I'm listening to the GPS. The GPS is wrong. No, it's not. Yes, it is. And, of course, she's always right. So, but, you know, we walk by, and we'll be talking, and, and we're, we're, we're journeying together. I call it this way. Put God on walkie-talkie mode. Often we say, I'll see you later. We hang up the phone. Instead, be like a first responder. First responder, policeman or fireman or something like that, they have a walkie-talkie on. And they're always open to the central office, always ready to call in what's going on, aren't they? I want to encourage you to stay in a prayerful mindset throughout the day. Say, God, thank you that you're walking through me in this area of work. The boss is driving me crazy, but God, thank you for my boss. Give me the strength to overcome this. Or my employees are driving me nuts or whatever's going on. And so pray in the spirit at all times and all occasions. Stay alert and what? Persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. We're called to pray for each other. Now, how do we do that? When we pray together and stand together, we fight together and we win together. This is how it works. Well, that's really enthusiastic. Thank you. <laughs> that's called manipulation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. But seriously, though, we fight together. We put our faith together. We use the word together, and we can take things together we cannot take by ourselves. If you're winning, if you're trying to run this race all by yourself, raising kids all by yourself, trying to go to school all by yourself, the way we overcome is this. Because why? Stay alert. Watch for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And that's really encouraging. Thank you for telling me that. I like to watch Animal Planet. And I never forget watching the Serengeti. And there's a group of zebras going across the Serengeti. And they're running in a pack. As long as they're in a pack, they're good. Because they'll get their hoofs. And they'll kick against the tigers together. But what can happen is this. When they're going across the Serengeti, they go through a river that they pray. I don't like cats, but they do pray at least. Thank you. Last night I had a, no, I was kidding. I was a, but what they do is the cats, they pray, and they look for weakness. 
And if one of the zebras gets out of the pack and runs a little slower than the pack and gets isolated, then the tiger or that lion pounces on that zebra and takes him down. It's a sad sight to see. It's incredible. You watch it, what happens. This is why it's so important. My old pastor used to say, you know, a banana is safe in the bunch. But if you're off the bunch, it gets peeled and eaten. So I want to encourage you to get connected. I know that's, that's good theology. I know. I, just go ahead. Pastor Joe Timberlake, if you're watching, thank you for that corny. Okay. But anyhow, so what would happen is that we need to work together. We need to watch out for each other. If there's safety in numbers. There's strength in numbers. Don't do this by yourself. You're not called to do it by yourself. Begin to fight with other people. I want to encourage you as you leave here today, as you leave, you'll see a booth over there. It says small groups. Again, this is about connecting, giving you an opportunity to connect. Don't go through life alone. If you can't find a small group, we'll make one up for you on your connection card. I'm going to ask the worship team to get themselves ready at this point. So let's begin to fight together. And this is what I encourage you to do. The Bible says, as we go through the Scripture one more time here. So what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to fight together. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, the perseverance and supplication with all the saints. Listen, I want to encourage you to do something. Take the scriptures, Ephesians 6, and 13, 10 through 18, and pray over it. Say, Father, this morning, I'm putting, like you get dressed in the morning, I'm putting on the belt of truth. Lord, I choose to walk in truth today. I choose to focus on truth, not lies. I thank you that I am made in your image. And just begin to speak the truth and pray for the breastplate of righteousness. God, I choose to think rightly today. I choose to forgive people today. I choose not to be bitter. And begin to pray through these things together and watch what God will do in our lives. Let's bow our heads. Father, I want to thank you so much that you did not leave us alone, that you sent us your spirit, and we thank you for the word of God, which is like a love letter, which is like an instruction manual, which is a love letter that tells us how we are to live our lives. And Father, we recognize that life is difficult at times. We recognize, Lord, that we are in a battle, that we are fighting, and that we need you in our lives. And Father, I just pray for everyone here right now that's going through a hard time, going through difficulties in their marriage, going through difficulty not being able to find a job, not able to pay the bills, health issues, loneliness issues. Lord, maybe some of us have come here this morning and we smile and everyone thinks we got our stuff together, but secretly we're crying on the inside. Father, we want to thank you that we are strong in you. And Lord, we recognize we're in a battle. We want to give our lives to you today afresh. Lord, I pray we connect this church and connect us that we would not fight it alone, that we would choose to walk in your truth in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. You know, you may have gone to church all your life. You may have been confirmed. You may have been born in the church. You know, it isn't about doing the right thing or being, doing the right thing. What it's really about is giving your life to Jesus Christ. The truth is this. All of us, the Bible says, all of us sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There's not one that's right, no, not one. But Jesus loved us so much that while we were sinners, Christ died for us and paid a debt for all the things that you did wrong, all the horrible things you and I ever did. Jesus paid the price for it all. You can never measure up to be good enough. And God says, I know you can't be good enough. And so I'm not asking you to be good enough. What I'm asking you to do is trust me. Hand your life over to me. Let me forgive you of your sins. And let's begin a new life together. That's what God wants to do. He wants to save us from our sins and... One day, we're going to have to stand before God and give an account for our life. And God wants you to be with Him, but there's something that will separate you from God, and that's called sin, not giving your sins to God. God wants to forgive you and give you everlasting life with Him. And so if you'd like to do that today, I'm going to just pray a prayer. and just bow your heads, and I'm going to pray a prayer. And this is simply this. If you were to pray this prayer and mean it, it's a new beginning. If you want to pray quietly yourself, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and paid for all the sins I've ever done. 
I recognize I'm not good enough, but you are. I receive the payment of everything I've ever done wrong. I receive your forgiveness right now. Forgive me from all the things I've ever done wrong. And I choose this day to follow you all the days of my life with your help. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer for the first time or make a new commitment. Just tell me a quick show of hands. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Anyone today? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's just thank God this morning for people making a decision for God. You know, in your in your uh, worship guide, there's a little card, a connection card. I want to encourage you to fill that out and say, I made a commitment to Christ today. We want to help you through the process. Let's all stand as we have a closing song. As we do that, I'm going to ask our prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayers for anything at all, we want to be able to pray with you and encourage you that you would go strong in Him. Okay, everybody? To shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love cannot be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected God bless you guys. Listen, we're going to leave the front open. If you need prayers, we want to pray with you. Otherwise, we dismiss you. Let's walk in strength. Let's be strong in the Lord. Amen, everybody. God bless you.